Let's journey and journal from England to Australia in 1879. Hello and welcome to The Treasured Page. I'm Melanie and this is our quiet crafting space. It's really raining outside today and there's been a thunderstorm and it's all gone cold. And so I'm just coming in here to play in this lovely journal. And it's a soft, cosy one with the with the felt on the outside and I keep forgetting to show you the back so that's the back of it um, so I'm just um, putting in a few extra embellishments just to make the pages a little bit more interesting so two exciting things I found my tweezers very happy that the craft from fairies brought those back and the other thing I've noticed or found or sort of tidied up a bit actually and here we have um, some new foam dobbers so I'm going to take one of those I think they've been near the windowsill because they've sort of discoloured a bit uh, but look at the state of this so this is um, this is my all-purpose brownie grunge one and uh, we're going to <laughs> we're going to say goodbye to that I've only changed this twice in the last six months so I think it is time it's all coming to pieces and the little bits a foam all over the project so we say goodbye farewell thanks for the memories and then we're going to start with this ah there we go okay right so that's happened we've got that I'm bringing in my little ephemera holder here folding it out and seeing if I can add some labels into this because I've just noticed that I think I want something there so I've got this I've got the tweezers at the ready and maybe this one as well I'm liking this so if you haven't um, so, if, so if you're new here this is the ephemera holder that I use and I put all the labels and things that I think I'm going to use when I'm embarking on a project such as this larger journal so this is just for me this is my ideas book this helps me develop some ideas and I can just come and play in here when I just feel like I want to expand some knowledge or certainly want to escape really. So I'm just going to add a few little embellishments on and I'm going to tell you the story so far. We've left Marianne in India and she's about to head home with all her very many paintings. So let's have a listen to the rest, the next, next part of her adventurous stories. So Marianne spent an entire year travelling around India in 1878 and by the 21st of March 1879 Marianne is back in cold and icy England. Friends flock around to her flat in Victoria Street in London eager to hear about India and admire her latest sketches. It was all very wearisome, though, telling the same old stories time and time again, so she decides to hire a room in a gallery in Conduit Street to exhibit her oil sketches of India and the archipelago painted on the spot. The exhibition was open for two months and the studio described it as intelligent and useful applied art labour. And after the exhibition was over, Marianne decides to write a very important letter. Shrewsbury Station is not perhaps a place where many people sit and write letters, but it was there on the 11th of August 1879 that Marianne North took up her pen to write to Sir Joseph Hooker, the director of the Royal Botanical Gardens Kew. She wanted to inquire whether he would accept her paintings as a gift to Kew Gardens. Marion North had missed her train and characteristically she had not wished to be idle for even an hour or two and she wrote her letter putting forward an idea which she had been brooding over for quite some time. It had, in fact, even been suggested after her exhibition in Conduit Street earlier that, that year that paintings should find their ultimate home at Kew. 
In her letter to Sir Joseph, Marianne had not only proposed to build a gallery to house the pictures, which would have a guardian's house and a studio attached, but she wanted visitors to be provided with tea or coffee and biscuits, nothing else but at a fair price. Marianne went to visit her sister and brother-in-law in Davaros in Switzerland. But the cold as she wrote in her journal, did not agree with my old body. And so she went on to Italy. Here she was delighted to see Edward Lear, who uncorked all kinds of nonsense for her benefit. He would stop in the busy streets to deliver such a joke that Marianne thought the Italians must wonder who the old pair of lunatics were, laughing and joking. His laughter doses gave her more good than any doctor's prescription. At his villa in San Remo, he made her eat pellucid periwinkle soup, mulberry jam and every other kind of luxury only Mr Lear could think of. One wonders if it was served on a runcible spoon. Returning home again, she was thrilled that her offer of pictures and a gallery at Kew had been accepted by Sir Joseph Hooker. He had agreed to all of her ideas, all except for the tea or coffee and the biscuits. Sir Joseph had suggested that the impossibilities of keeping the great British public in order, especially on a bank holiday when there might be 77,000 people all at once, was too much for them to entertain. Well, news of not being allowed tea and coffee refreshments in her gallery hit Marianne very hard. I mean, how ridiculous. You can't have a cup of tea when looking at a painting. So she did take that on as a total challenge much later in life to see if she could rectify that. But she set that aside because a further excitement came in the form of an invitation from Charles Darwin, who had expressed a wish to meet with the remarkable Miss North. He told her that she should not attempt any representation of the world's flora without seeing the peculiar vegetation of Australia. And she felt that this was a royal command and decided to go to Australia at once. The voyage to Australia took Marianne via Sarawak once more and she stayed with the White Raja and the Rani, otherwise known as, in England, as Mr and Mrs Brooks. The voyage to Brisbane was full of interest and as the ship neared the new continent, she was warned by a curious woman-hating Russian baron that the Brisbane hotel she planned to stay in was the most dreadful hole in the universe, beastly food and rooms, and would not do for a lady. Marianne took no notice but did not have to stay too long as she received an invitation from the government house due to one of her letters of introduction and she had a room where the garden opened straight out onto the botanical gardens. However, she did find at that time the city to be unattractive, the gardens dried up and the hospitality of the old-fashioned order was not a patch on those of the temperate house at Kew. But soon all that was left behind and she started on her great Antipodean exploration. At every turn she came across new plants which needed their portraits painting, extraordinary forests of eucalyptus or gum trees, wattles and aces, and their yellow balls of flowers, banksias dripping with delicious honey, tree ferns and many other things she had never even dreamed of. The vegetation of Western Australia was unbelievably rich, like a natural flower garden. Without moving, she could pick 25 different flower species in one glance. She was fascinated too by the birds and the animals, brilliantly coloured parrots, black swans, huge pelicans, laughing jackasses and hundreds of cockatoos who flew ahead of them screeching and then settled on a tree for a gossip. 
before flying on again. There were koalas, shy platypuses, mice with fringed tails who seemed to glide through the air like bats. And in the Banya Mountains, she had her first sight of a party of kangaroos hopping down a hillside in comical procession. And the Australian people were very friendly, and Marianne particularly approved of the women who were independent, efficient and sensible. She visited all sorts of -of out-of-the-way places, sometimes travelling into the bush where trees and bushes had to be chopped down to enable their buggy to proceed. And in Sydney she visited the botanical gardens but lamented on new houses which were springing up like fungi all around the town. Melbourne she thought a noble city and it was there that she met the great German botanist Baron von Müller who, with much excitement about her painting of the rare eucalyptus macrocarpus, and when she showed him a bud which she had been saving especially for Q, he calmly pocketed it with, Fair lady, you permit I take that. In Albany, Western Australia, Marianne stayed with Ellis Rowan the brilliant Australian botanical and wildlife artist who had that year won a gold medal for her wildlife paintings at the Melbourne International Exhibition. Marion thought Mrs Rowan a very pretty fairy-like woman, always well-dressed, and much admired her exquisite and delicate watercolours done in a peculiar way of her own on grey paper. In one letter to Sir Joseph Hooker, Marianne described Mrs Rowan's pictures as very beautiful and worth your attention. It is believed that Marianne had given Mrs Rowan tuition in oil painting, for although the Australian artist continued painting her botanical branches in watercolour, it was after this visit that she began to experiment in oils. In Melbourne, much later in 1888... Mrs Rowan's prize-winning exhibit was a large painting of chrysanthemums done in oils. It is probable too that Mrs Rowan was inspired by the intrepid English woman's account of her astonishing travels, for in 1883 she took the first of her long and arduous journeys to paint the plants and wildlife of other lands. Most of the Australians had extraordinary healthy appetites, noted Marianne. Prodigious quantities of beef were served in both houses and inns. At one hostelry there were beef steaks for breakfast, roast beef for dinner and boiled beef for tea. Cobb and Co, a firm whose coaches served all Australia, were much excited by transporting Marianne and the lady friend. The first ladies who apparently travelled by their coach's firm. And they wired for extra beef to be available at the next stopping place. Marianne enjoyed dipping her cup into the billy, the huge saucepan in which the tea was boiled. And once, when they were trying to boil the billy, the surrounding vegetation caught fire and they all had to flee. And so it sounds as if Marianne has had a fantastic time exploring Australia and she sends back some amazing paintings from the regions she visits. The next leg of Marianne's journey takes her to Tasmania and New Zealand. Okay, what a story. It's all unfolding now. So that's the little flower that I've added there with some musical note labels. That's from Clee Blatt's uh, monochrome label. That's uh, come from here. That's the larger one. So we get uh, all different sizes in this one. Monochrome labels, they're lovely, aren't they? And look at that. That is beautiful. I'll show you up close. If you can see, can you see that beautiful fabric, chiffon sort of fabric that she's got there covering her bust? That is actually um, an Indian fabric that they used to have. And it... It comes from India and it was woven in India. It's called Dhaka 
muslin. So it's like a, a muslin cloth fabric, but it was so fine and so sheer and so rare and so difficult to make that it was the most expensive fabric that you could get in Victorian times. Marie Antoinette used to flaunt it like, exactly like that. So it would be it would have been worn exactly like that, quite risque because it was see-through and it was so sheer, so fine, and they could put some delicate um, lace and embroidery onto it as well. And there's only some very famous pieces remaining. It, you can't make it anymore. So it was um, there's quite a history of fabric of, of that nature, and uh, they used to sell it to the rich and famous people that would travel and seek it out. Uh, Marianne North used to try and find it in the markets herself because it was so soft and she used to like to wear it because it was so soft as an undergarment cloth um, to have clothing made out of it. Uh, but yes, it was pricey, but she she used to travel around India and they used to be able to find it and... and um, she would get it for a market price. She knew where to go. It's also quite interesting about this cloth. Used to call it woven air, or that was the translation was woven air, or the it was like the skin of the moon. It was that special. It was so soft. It was the softest fabric you could get. It was be better than silk. It was unsub unsustainable for the craftspeople to keep going because. Uh, it was an expensive method, there were cheaper ways of making cloth and it died out and then they lost all the knowledge on how to make it and nobody knows how to make it anymore. And so it's one of those uh, sort of it's like extinct <laughs> piece of cloth, you can't get it anymore. So that was just interesting because it comes up in Marianne's story, which I have read elsewhere, that when she was travelling she was seeking out this particular cloth and it just so happens to be part of the monochrome labels that it's actually showing how it would have been worn. And I think that's really fascinating. So, yeah, these labels are lovely because they're highlighting this era and I, I appreciate that because it's helping with my stories. <laughs> so that's good. So here we go. So I've added, the, I've added the label, the flower, another label there, and just tying some of these pages together. A little bit of lace, a little bit of um, fabric there, another label, and then everything just seems to make a bit more sense. I've got a nice pocket here for watercolour papers or artist papers oh and that's the moth so that's a fun find and this is it's cotton paper so it is a rag it's made of cotton rags it's not rag paper in the sense that it's a 1700s piece of paper no it's a modern day cotton paper for the purpose of artist watercolour it's quite thick very thick actually so I've added that there because it's a bit of a special paper and that's nice to look at and feel in the journal. So we've got this to cover. Um, I've added more lace down here, which was there, so that finishes off that little turnover bit. So this is sheet music used there and there, quite like that, little pocket. So little pocket there now and then I've got to come up with something for that side. And here is a tuck. So I've been been slowly working to make this make sense and then this is going to be another page later on in the story as is this possibly we'll do some ephemera for that um, this feels like my um, New Zealand page I think is this is this New Zealand no this isn't this is that's Sri Lanka so that's that's Sri Lanka that's India India, so we spent a year there, so that's not sure what this is. This is um, Jamaica. Um, this is a very... This page feels like we want to do something there. This was Java, and then... I don't know. And then we had other things. It's all bouncing around. None of it. It doesn't make any sense at all. Okay, so this page looks like it needs something doing to it. Right, I feel like I'm just going to do a collage here. And what I've got is, um, well, a little dish of water. Hang on, that's not going to get us anywhere. Let's put in some PVA glue. Just a wet school glue. And um, 
what I want to do is just paste onto this page and the glue is quite a lot but I think I'm going to need it. The glue is going to act as a bonding agent for this paper which I think is it's like a um, construction paper and it's quite, yeah, I sh probably shouldn't have put it in the journal. It's not a hard wearing one and I'm getting a tear so I think I need to put other paper on there and we'll just do that as a collage so I've just got a runny just made it extra runny I had a little bit of water in there just left from when I rinsed the cup out so and we need to maybe go for some book page or something that might be I like the idea of text so I'm gonna have a little look what I've got over oh my oh yes oh look I'm gonna bring this in before this all falls to pieces so this this is a sheet of book page from the 1890s. Um, so this is after Marianne has died, but it is a piece of paper from that that decade. So let's let's add that because that's what I've got. And quite quite interestingly, when she sent off her letter to Kew Gardens to ask about the whether she could have a gallery. She posted it, after she posted it, she then went directly off to go abroad to go and visit her sister, freezing cold, didn't like it, so went directly over to, to Italy to go and meet up with friends over there. And then, you know, who did she meet was Edward Lear happens to be there because he, he has... Um, a villa he has a place where he lives there so she's in Italy with Edward Lear now if anybody got the reference about her eating um, dining with him and eating from a runcible spoon the runcible spoon of course comes from the poem the owl and the pussycat and who wrote that Edward Lear so Edward Lear is famous for the owl and the pussycat poem and so I probably better read that for those that don't know and then we can hear that and understand. But if you imagine that that was written in this time frame, so it was first published in 1871 and that is the time that Marianne set sail for her big voyage and she was friends with Edward Lear. And Edward Lear also is an illustrator, so he's an artist he illustrates for Lord Tennyson as well so that is all connected all connected and then yes so they're looking out so Marion's got this wonderful fabric that she brings back she's probably gifting her sister with this beautiful fabric that she's finding in the markets um, that would have pre been one of the reasons why she would have bought it she would have had some for herself or make because it was just so so comfortable and so lightweight when you're traveling around a lightweight comfortable fabric absolutely ideal and breathable as well because it's cotton so that was um that's that fabric that is like the moon and um and also it could even have inspired stories of the Emperor's um, new clothes because at one point it was only really for uh, people that could afford this fabric and they the Emperor gave it to his daughter and she put she had a whole dress made out of this sh very fine sheer fabric. She was absolutely dressed up in lots of petticoats of the stuff but in the light, when it caught her, you could see right through it. So it was very um, risque and, uh, of course, it looked like she had nothing on. And, and then maybe if the emperor had had some as well, it would have been like the emperor's new clothes. The story of that, if you're familiar with that, where it, he was laughed at for not wearing any clothes. But he was tricked by his tailor. But it could have been this darker fabric that they were all raving about and this piece of paper is of interest because it is 
about the British Postal Service at the time. It's an act, so it's a new law that's being brought in to make the provision of better postal service uh, for the local authorities. So, uh, the, yeah, imagine writing a letter, a very important one, and then having to go away on holiday because you don't know when you're going to get an answer. It could be one week, it could be three months. That was how bad the postal system was and we send something and moan if it doesn't arrive the next day or the day after but in these times they could have been waiting weeks and I've got this and I like the idea of what I've just been talking about with the fabric so I'm just going to stick that straight down because this looks like a sheer fabric with some embroidery on but it's not really it's paper but the fact that you can see through it is rather fun so I'll just add that in there. The owl and the pussycat. Oh, then we could. this could be about the owl and the pussycat. So I've got here what could be a runcible spoon, but I think a runcible spoon has actually had three prongs in it. It was a spoon with three prongs, so it was the very first spork, which doesn't sound anything like as intriguing as runcible spoon oh you have to roll your r's if you're going to say it properly runcible spoon there we go <laughs> and um owl and pussycat Kleeback creations we've got it and a runcible spoon i'm going to have all three and they're going on here the owl and the pussycat went to sea in a beautiful pea green boat they took some honey and plenty of money wrapped up in a five pound note. The owl looked up to the stars above and sang to a small guitar. Oh, lovely pussy, oh, pussy, my love, what a beautiful pussy you are, you are, you are. What a beautiful pussy you are. Pussy said to the owl, you elegant fowl, how charmingly sweet you sing. Oh, let us be married. Too long we have tarried, but what shall we do for a ring? They sailed away for a year and a day to the land where the bong tree grows. And there in a wood, a piggywig stood with a ring at the end of his nose, his nose, his nose, with a ring at the end of his nose. Dear pig, are you willing to sell for one shilling your ring? said the piggy. I will. So they took it away and were married next day by the turkey who lives on the hill. They dined on mints and slices of quince which they ate with a runcible spoon. And hand in hand on the edge of the sand they danced by the light of the moon, the moon, the moon. They danced by the light of the moon. And... How much fun is that? And wouldn't you just want to have some fun in Italy and hang out with somebody who wrote The Owl and the Pussycat? Unbelievable. What a fantastic piece of information and discovery there we've made today. So I had no idea. And so that so that's really, really good fun. I love that. I love that page. And I'm very happy. And I will just carry on. I'll find a little label and a bit of fruit or something in my stash. And I'll do a picture for you at the end. So there we go, everybody. I hope that that was a little bit of, um, of fun today and that you really enjoyed listening to the stories. And I will be back very soon with my next video. I've also got to look at the page set up for my Winter Whisper journal, which is uh, going to be really nice, I think. And then I will start to tie up some of this and then we can have a look at other projects. So we must do some more scrap busting. So we've done a little collage there, but that's not really that I need to get rid of some of the scrap wraps and now I'm going to wash my hands of all the glue okay thank you very much for being with me and above everything else just slow down and make crafting time for you bye bye now mm -hmm.